Good morning, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to the Mesa City Council study session for the morning of June the 17th. Uh, the first item on our agenda for this meeting is to review our agenda for this Monday night's meeting. So, Council, if you could please take a look at that document. Um, starting off, is there any questions? Uh, anybody like some additional information on any items on Monday's agenda? Hey, Mayor, this is David. Hi. Uh, the, the only item I had a question was on 3L, and I was hoping maybe Corey Hayes could speak on that. Thank you. 3L. We've, we've been waiting for an, a reason to bring Corey Hayes up, haven't we? Yeah. <laughs> Corey, good to see you. Member Luna, I, I am assuming I don't have the sheet yes, in front of yes, me. Yes, yes, he's here and he's uh, anxious to hear you talk about the burn building. Okay, yeah, we are very excited. We, we have, this has been uh, a long haul for, it's been a long haul for us. I think it's actually been a longer haul for several other people in this room um, to get through this process, but we are very, very excited. We feel like that we have worked closely with, with engineering to come up with a great burn building. We're excited to see what we we've come up with, uh, surprising. I'm sure you guys will be surprised by this. But the, the design of the burn building is actually a little smaller than the original. I know that's not normally how the fire department does things, but it's actually a little bit smaller square footage than the previous building. But we have optimized uh, a lot of the design and made it a very functional building for us um, long term. We see this as, as a great burn building for our firefighters for, for many years to come. So we're excited um, as soon, if this goes through today uh, and then on Monday at council, we will be moving very quickly. The team in engineering has been exceptional in um, working with our contractor and they are ready to start turning dirt probably within two weeks of approval. So we're excited. I don't know if you have any specific questions about it. No, that's that's pretty much it. You know, there's a few of us on council that have been here for a while and remember the history around surrounding the buildings. So I just wanted to get an update where we were. And so I appreciate you providing that and we look forward to the construction of that building. We do too. Thank you. Thank you, Assistant Chief Corey Hayes. Thanks, Good to Mark. have you with us. Um, council, other, other questions about Monday's agenda? While you're thinking, I, I have one that the, um, maybe someone from the police department can update us a little bit on 3H, the Axon camera purchase. I know we've been talking about this for a while and uh, the fact that, uh, did, did this may be updated, I, know, I think all of, our, of, all of our patrol officers have had cameras for a while and this is expanding that program. Uh, I see we're spending $2 million the first year, a million and a half, you know, years two through five. So can you just flesh that out for me a little bit? Who, who doesn't have cameras? Who's getting cameras? Uh, and how many cameras are we buying? That sort of thing. Absolutely, sir. So uh, what we're doing here is we are adding uh, 211 cameras to our existing Axon deployment. So what that'll do is give all essential officers uh, Axon cameras, whether that be a, a head mount or a body mount, depending on the assignment. So uh, right now it's predominantly patrol, but this will also cover um, other areas like spec ops, our sergeants on the field, uh, the bike squad, the uh, PMGA, uh, some cameras for the SROs, some, some things like that. And then what it'll leave out is uh, predominantly uh, command staff and officers that work in administrative assignments officers that are uh, in the hiring unit or, in, or in, uh, assigned to the IT unit, the couple officers in there, uh, folks in the air unit, though they're not um, administrative capacity, that would be done via the helicopters and things like that. Um, uh, officers assigned to internal affairs, those types of units would not have them. Let me clarify, this is not only the purchase of the additional 211, it, isn't it also includes the replacement of the existing Yes, sir. It's a complete renewal. It's a five-year renewal of the contract. So it'll increase our total cameras by 211. So it'll give us a new five-year contract at the increased quantity. My recollection on this issue is the expensive part is the data storage beyond just the acquisition of the equipment. Do, do these prices include additional data storage or is that a separate agenda item? That's all, right. all included, sir. And uh, the contract is actually both the body cameras and the uh, taser energy weapons. 
So in the new contract, one of the other things that's included in that for the energy weapons is it includes the replacement of bat batteries and then the cartridges that contain the actual dart that's deployed, whereas currently those are things we pay out of pocket in an a la carte fashion as we need them. So that's all included. And then on the camera side, all the data storage and then cycle replacement of those cameras is also covered under the contract. Great. The only other question I have on this topic is that it seems like occasionally we have situations where we, uh, we have an incident occur, uh, we're disappointed to find out there is not video coverage of that incident, and there may have been a camera there, but it wasn't turned on. I mean, at some point, I'd like to learn more about our policies uh, as to when is an officer required to have the camera on. Yeah, Mayor, Council, uh, our policy does require that any time an officer uh, responds to a, a call for service in the field that they are required to activate their uh, axon body camera. Um, with the, the addition of these uh, to some specialty units, uh, there's still some policy revision that's being done uh, to consider specialty assignments such as the school resource officers. There's some uh, times when an officer would not activate an axon body camera in a school setting, uh, but they are required anytime they're responding to an incident, to an a investigation, to activate their body camera. Okay, so it, it, I guess it, that makes sense that on the school campus and in other situations there'd be uh, reasons not to have the camera on. And I guess what you're telling me is otherwise the, uh, the policy is if, when you're interacting with the public, the camera's to be on. That's correct. Council, other, other questions on this agenda item? Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, as long as I'm talking, I, I also had a question about 3I, the real-time crime center. I don't know, there you go. I, I thought maybe that was the, the same cast of characters there. Uh, tell us a little bit more about this. I, I guess I'm, I, I, I'm, I totally buy into to using more uh, CCTV to help with, with the police department's mission, but uh, where is this going to be? Is there going to be 24-7 surveillance? You know, somebody sitting in a command center just uh, uh, as calls come up, zooming from one part of the city to another, or, or how, how is this going to function? Mayor and council members, uh, the Real-Time Crime Center will be located on the third floor of the police department headquarters building. Uh, in what is currently our tactical operations center, we're going to do uh, some uh, minor remodeling and uh, restructuring of that area uh, to accommodate the real-time crime center. Ultimately, our goal is to staff it 24-7. Um, initially, we will start off uh, with staffing that covers our highest uh, times and days of the week where we have our highest volume of, of emergency calls for service. And um, we will have a real-time crime center operator uh, who is monitoring uh, access to all the cameras that live feed into the real-time uh, crime center. They will uh, feed that intelligence information from those uh, cameras as well as additional intelligence uh, tools that they have access to and they'll feed that real-time back out to the responding officers. So ideally the officer as they're responding to an emergency call for service, they're getting live information as much as possible on uh, camera footage of possible suspects, suspect vehicles, and getting that before they even arrive on scene. Chris, you, I mean, Commander, we could talk about this in relationship to the uh, cameras that ca the council's purchased, the ones we're putting in the parks. I don't know what the title, I can't remember what we've Yes, yeah, so those to. overt camera systems that, uh, uh, that we've purchased for the parks, those also will be uh, integrated or uh, feed into the real-time crime center. So our uh, real-time crime center operator will be able to proactively monitor those cameras and, uh, and report uh, incidents to uh, officers in the field. Uh, I know it's been mentioned uh, before, I think Council Member Duff mentioned the Pioneer Park incident where we had that overt camera being monitored, essentially, and the, the officer watched a, a violent crime take place and was able to put that information out immediately uh, within literally a minute, a uh, minute and a half, uh, officers apprehended the suspect before he even really left the, the park location. And um, very serious violent crime, attempted homicide, and uh, was solved very quickly because of that uh, camera monitoring system. And so that's what we envision taking more globally, citywide, 
uh, with a real-time crime center operation. Thank you. I, I have seen a facility at transportation, you know, a, a wall of screens, and I, and I, I think most of our intersections are, have cameras. I, I assume the real-time crime center will have access to those video feeds. Correct. That's our goal is to have uh, real-time access to all of our transportation cameras, all of our CCTV at our city facilities. Um, the, the equipment that we're looking at also has the opportunity for us to partner with the community and allow the community to um, uh, allow access and, and they control uh, the ability to allow that access. Uh, also, there's a camera registry uh, uh, part of this that allows them to register their cameras to at least let us know that they have a camera. Should we have a, a crime in a neighborhood, that would allow us to know quickly who has cameras in that area and we could reach back out to those residents uh, to uh, determine if they have any footage of a particular crime. Okay. Great. Thank you. Vice Mayor. This is great information. Thank you. I wanted to inquire a little further on the neighborhoods um, and neighbors who have camera systems. I'm particularly working in a neighborhood that has some uh, several crime elements going on. And I'm talking to the residents there, some of them do have cameras and are recording a lot of the incidents that are going on. So what is the appropriate protocol? Do they contact you? Do I provide the information to you as far as getting their permission they've offered, you know, since they have a recording of some of these incidents. With the real-time crime center, uh, the, the part of that program that uh, is a registry is called Community Connect. And uh, as we get that system online, what we will do is uh, there'll be a marketing uh, uh, portion of that program. We will have flyers and, and information online for residents on how they can go in and register their you know, their cameras with the police department. Currently now, if they have the video and uh, they believe uh, it's related to a crime, then uh, you just contact the police department with that information through our non-emergency number and, and it would get uh, linked to the right case. So would this apply to um, many residents, including me? I have a ring on my doorbell and it records, you know, has information there. If there was an, you, usually a resident doesn't want that feeding in the police station and, and you don't want that either. But if they record something on their ring, then they would just reach out to, uh, there's the neighborhood app. Does the police station monitor? Yes, we, we have access to yeah. the neighborhood okay. app and our detectives and crime prevention officers uh, monitor that. With the ring, we have a relationship with, uh, with mm -hmm. ring where uh, if a resident uh, registers their ring camera, we, we are notified um, of those, those cameras that uh, are registered with the police department. So uh, to be registered with the police department on your ring camera, that would be through the community connect so that you would have permission to um, Currently, use well, the footage? A so, bit so under the community connect is sort of an umbrella program, council okay. member. And there's really two, uh, two pieces of that program. One is a live feed program that's really geared for businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 Circle K gas station, for example, mm -hmm. and we can work with them to gain live access to external video feeds for that that would feed to the real-time crime center. When we're talking about you know, citizens' uh, home security cameras and things like that, that falls under that registry piece where uh, they would register with us and we would know that there's a citizen at a certain location that has a camera and they're willing to share video with us upon request. And then that uh, becomes that information becomes available inside of the real time crime center is part of this goal. So if there's an incident in a certain location, we can pull up a map and we can look at that and say, oh, there's three citizen cameras in that area that are registered and reach out to those citizens to determine if they have video and then work with them. Uh, there's a method to upload that directly through a portal that we can put in place for them. That's great. Um, one of the things I know I suggested to um, Mr. Brady uh, a week or so ago, it's on another, but we have the Mesa now or the um, CityLink app. 
And just for those incidents where you notice something going down, going on, and you can snap a photo, being able just to upload that quickly without having to go to your computer, <laughs> find the non-emergency, fill out the information, sure. it would be a great way to for citizens to contribute information, license plates, uh, photos of... I watched a drug deal go down uh, a couple days ago and snapped the photo of the license plate and, and recorded that. But I know our residents are really a valuable tool in combating crime in their neighborhoods. And somehow, however we can integrate with them and empower them to help us, I think will certainly um, minimize the crimes when we have a lot of eyes on our properties. There's obviously a very large technology component to the Real-Time Crime Center, and really the goal behind all of that technology is to take all of these different things that are out there and unify them. So that instead of, uh, you, for example, transportation cameras being their own kind of feed and city structure cameras and, and public cameras, is to give the Real-Time Crime Center uh, a single screen where they can see where our officers are, where the calls are, where we have camera feeds available, um, provide uh, easier me uh, methods for collecting video and, and things like that, and trying to take all of those things that do currently exist and unifying them in a way that uh, increases the, the speed at which we can receive and process that intelligence. That's great. I, I look forward to working with you with our communities as those things become available so that we can make our neighborhoods safer. Um, on, on the parks, do we have cameras at all the parks or just certain parks? I know Pioneer was one. I'm not sure if it's still there. We only had limited cameras at the time. We, yeah, we just purchased four. So we all have four cameras that we'll build. And they're mobile, so we can, we'll be able to move them around. And I know there's been recent conversations between the Parks Department and PD about where those will go when they, when they come in. So they'll be moved around. We don't have them in every park, but right. that's the idea is to move, be able to move those around where they're needed. Great. Thank you. Mr. Reddy, and then Mr. Thompson. Quick, uh, what's the timeline? Uh, also, what's the, uh, are, are the equipment that uh, officers have compatible to the system that's going in? And those are two questions I had. As far as timeline, when this will be deployed or, or an operational, and then the equipment, do we have to buy new equipment or is the equipment that we have compatible to what's being installed? Yeah, council member, our, uh, our timeline was yesterday, actually. We wish <laughs> we, we had it yesterday. We're, our goal is to have it up and operational by uh, the end of the year, first of, of next year. Um, and with respect to the equipment, uh, a lot of it will be compatible with the existing cell phone technology that our officers have. So when we're sending out video, um, that will go directly to the officer's uh, cell phone and or their uh, computer in their vehicle. And other equipment? No, I, th I think you cover pretty well. Though the 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 main application, which is what what's before you today for the real time crime center, also has a mobile piece that will go on the officer's cell phone. All sworn officers have cell phones today, so we will be able to move data back and forth to them through that same application. Yeah, my my question is um, oversight. Um, is there? Is there going to be uh, a plan in place for oversight to ensure that somebody's not just sitting there cruising through uh, live videos of our community, our citizens, our you know um, privacy concerns and so forth? So, do we have what what, what are we going to have in place to ensure that's not happening? The uh, Council Member Thompson, the policy is uh, being developed right now for the Real Time Crime Center. It will include. Uh, audit capability, there will be a supervisor, a sergeant, and a lieutenant. Uh, eventually, initially there'll be a sergeant, eventually as we expand to 24-7 coverage, there'll be a lieutenant over uh, the real-time crime center operation. Uh, we will have, uh, the software itself has audit capabilities so that we can go in and audit and look uh, at what uh, our officers or the operators are looking at uh, as far as video. Um, Every time that we go in there, though, there will be a incident number attached to uh, that case, essentially, with the exception of the proactive time when we're looking at parks and viewing that. But we will have audit capability and oversight uh, to ensure that uh, uh, the privacy of, of everyone is uh, preserved. Also keep in mind uh, that 
initially the majority of the cameras that we will have will be public uh, cameras that uh, are our city transportation cameras in public open areas. We're not really talking about um, you know, people's in residential uh, locations or inside their, their backyards, that kind of thing as well. Okay. Other questions? All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Council, any other questions about Monday? Mr. Uh, Freeman. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to point out on 4F, we're, we're entering to it. I think Chief Hayes perked her head up there. Uh, IGA with uh, Gilbert Fire and Rescue about cross service on ambulance service. So. Um, I don't know much of the details. However, I'm sure that, uh, you know, providing ambulance service for our respective communities and having backup services is essential for each of our communities. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Council, anything else? Uh, any other additional information you'd like for Monday's meeting? Just yes. one last question. 5C may or may not uh, remain on the consent agenda. <clears throat> okay. It's a zoning case, so we'll. Okay, got it. All right, anything else? If not, uh, thank you. That the next item on our agenda will be item 2A. That's to hear a presentation, discuss, and provide direction on the climate action plan. Appreciate all the good work that's gone into this. Good morning, Mayor, Council. Um, I'm Scott Boucher, the Director of Environmental Management and Sustainability here at the City of Mesa. I'm joined by Laura Heineman, who's a Deputy Director in Environmental and Sustainability, and uh, Andrea Alicote, who is a Diversity and Special Projects Manager in the City Manager's Office. And uh, we are here today to present the Climate Action Plan, the first Climate Action Plan for the City of Mesa. Um, so this, this plan, the intent of this plan is really is a guiding document for council and city departments to have a shared vision for our goals for sustainability and climate action. Uh, but in addition to that, this first draft really will lay out some specific actions for city operations and provide context to the community as we reach out to them, because the next, the next phase of this plan will be to reach out to the community over the summer. And I really think that this plan helps set a context and vision for those discussions that we'll be having with the community uh, during the summer and through the, the fall uh, for the community. And so really as we look, um, the, the city of Mesa's, Mesa's had a culture of sustainability. I've been here a couple of times uh, over the last several months to talk about sustainability as we've been preparing this plan for council. Um, and really the, the goal of this is to lower our environmental impact and guide sustainable growth in what is still a growing city. We're still growing very rapidly, so making sure that we're doing that in a sustainable way building resiliency within our operations to uh, adapt and mitigate climate uh, change that we see coming or that we are seeing already, uh, and really implementing those mitigation and adaption strategies. So um, the history of this a little bit uh, starts with, if you recall back in February, uh, I presented to council on our current sustainability initiatives and in addition to that, we presented focus areas that we'll discuss in a little bit more detail later, um, the focus areas that we thought a climate action plan may contain. Uh, and that was back in February of this year. And then in March, the council had their strategic planning session and added a strategic initiative of healthy environment. And that, that strategic initiative says that we will proactively and responsibly protect and conserve Mesa's environment, natural resources, to mitigate climate change by reducing carbon pollution. And so after that, in, in April, so the following month in April, with direction from council, we went to the Sustainability and Transportation Committee and presented some aspirational goals. So there were four aspirational goals that we had presented at that time. Um, and SAT had agreed with those aspirational goals that we'll discuss here in, in just a little bit and had recommended that we then bring those aspirational goals back to the full council. 
So the six focus areas, we'll, we'll go through those now. There's, there's three of them here, and I want to make sure these, these focus areas really do provide a framework for further areas of study and implementation. Now, as focus areas, they're not silos that are separate from each other. There's a lot of things that we call co-benefits that cross, cross these focus areas. And I'll just provide an example of that as we look at these three focus areas of energy, air quality, and heat mitigation. So the number one thing that we can do as far as reducing our, our carbon emissions is reducing the amount of energy that we're using. Whether that energy is for buildings, it's for pumps and motors, or it's for the vehicles that we drive on a day-to-day -day basis. If we can reduce the use of that energy, that's going to significantly impact what our carbon emissions are and reduce those emissions. But if you look then, if you reduce vehicle miles, that also crosses over into the air quality area, the focus area of air quality, um, because um, the vehicles and the emissions that vehicles have are causing air quality pro problems here locally in the valley. Uh, and then you look at the next one with heat mitigation and reducing those greenhouse gas emissions is one of the things that helps with heat mitigation also. So as you can see, um, being more efficient in the vehicles that we drive and reducing those vehicle miles has effects in all three of these areas. So that don't think of them as there's an energy area that we're going to deal with, there's an air quality area that we're going to deal with. Uh, really, it just helps us give some context and make sure that we're, we're able to focus and, and display these both to internal city operations and to our community in a way that can be understood, but understand there's co-benefits that exist with a lot of these programs that we have. The other three focus areas that we had were water stewardship, materials management, and food systems. And again, there's a lot of crossover that happens with these in the water stewardship. We have efficiency. Again, one of the best things that we can do is, is use less of the things that we have. Um, with materials management, we've been pushing the reduce and reuse side more than the recycle side, uh, knowing that that water bottle, if it doesn't ever have to be recycled, um, is a lot better choice than, than having the transportation and, and the energy that gets put into actually recycling it. Okay? And then when we look at the local food systems, this is another one where um, you'll see support local supply, so supporting local food systems. Again, when you look at food and the impact that food has on the environment, of course it's a necessity for all of us in order to live, like many of these things, um, but locally grown food will reduce the environmental impact because, again, it reduces the transportation, refrigeration, and the preservation of that food that needs to come to us uh, at a grocery store. So again, if you think about those things, transportation, refrigeration, those have effects on the other focus areas that we just discussed as far as energy efficiency, air quality, uh, and reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. Right? So the aspirational goals, really these are going to be, this is the exciting part about the, the plan also, these are overarching goals that can be measured for us. So uh, as we've been working through our sustainability programs, we have been measuring energy efficiency, um, you know, in the number of kilowatt hours that we save. One of the things that we haven't measured with our sustainability program necessarily and had a goal for is the carbon emission side of it. So this will set a goal for us and we will be able to, and we've gone through and developed, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, a carbon emissions inventory for city operations. So now that we have that, we have a baseline, we have a goal, and now we'll have an ability to put together a plan to work towards reaching that goal. Okay? Um, one of the things I want to point out as we, as we talked about uh, with the culture of sustainability within the city of Mesa, the departments are still going to be the owners of these programs and projects though. There's a lot of great programs within the city of Mesa, whether it's in our utilities groups, our transportation groups, our housing groups, the departments are still going to be the owners of this. This is just a document that will help guide all of those decisions and, and I think help counsel as you're asking questions and thinking about, okay, new programs or projects that are coming forward, how does this fit in with the climate action plan that we have passed? Right. So the, the big goal that we're going to have, and I'll, the next slide is going to list all four of the goals, is carbon neutrality. And this aspirational goal really is going to, to put us on the map with a lot of other cities. Okay. Uh, one of the things is emissions anywhere affect people everywhere. So emissions from the city of Mesa don't just stay within the city of Mesa. They're going to travel across the globe. 
And I think you can see that when you look at some of these cities, when you see that there's Melbourne or Rio de Janeiro, Minneapolis, Portland, Oregon, that this isn't just a Mesa issue that we're dealing with. This is a global issue that we're dealing with. So this is going to help put Mesa on that global stage as far as folks that are, that are accepting this and saying, uh, this is something that we need to deal with going forward. The next slide lays out what those four aspirational goals are. Uh, so aspirational goal number one is carbon neutrality. Uh, it's achieve carbon neutrality by 2050 by reducing greenhouse gas emissions and enhancing carbon sinks. Strive to reduce the carbon footprint of city operations by 50% by 2030. Aspirational goal number two is related to renewable energy and it's to prioritize the use of renewable and resilient energy to achieve 100% renewable energy by 2050. And then goal number three is dealing with materials management, to manage materials responsibly and divert 90% of that material from going to the landfill by 2050. And aspirational goal number four, which will be the, the first one I think that we will accomplish, um, will be to go out to the community for community action. And we have a plan together. Uh, Andrea is gonna speak next about that plan but really developing a community-based action items uh, that will be incorporated into the existing plan that we are presenting to you today. With that, I'll turn it over to uh, Andrea and she'll talk about the community outreach. Thank you, Scott. So yes, I think we definitely had heard from council and city management how, how crucial the community component is going to be as we um, make strides towards these efforts that we've identified here today. Um, so with our community engagement plan, the first step really is going to be should council choose to um, move forward with the resolution on Monday night, beginning Tuesday, we are going to start with an educational campaign um, through our social media accounts, through our varying um, newsletters and different um, channels that we have within the city to begin educating the public on the climate action plan itself those aspirational goals, the focus areas, and really highlight a lot of the uh, great work that Scott and his department has, energy resources, water resources. They have so much educational information and we will be able to uh, reuse and re-highlight that information throughout the summer in an educational effort. Um, next, we will be starting with a collaboration with Parks and Rec and their commercial facilities on their master planning efforts. Um, they are going to be already going out to the public uh, to engage them regarding uh, different uses within their facilities, how the public likes to use their parks, and a lot of those topics do overlie. So we will be uh, engaging the public with some questions on their community surveys and to get some initial information gathering so that way it can help further along uh, that engagement effort as we move into the fall. Uh, we will be looking to do a variety of focus groups. You can just see some of the different um, groups that we have listed there. We know that the youth have a strong voice on this particular topic. We want to engage and have uh, conversations specifically with our youth, business community, um, residents alike, local leaders, yourselves. Uh, we hope to invite you out to participate in those both educational and information gathering conversations with the public. We will be looking to do that through community meetings in each of the council districts. So looking to host at least one in-person and one virtual in each council district. And then again, stakeholder interviews. So collectively, uh, what we'll be looking for from the public is really to help us prioritize a lot of the action items um, that we have listed for further study in the climate action plan on behalf of city operations, and then also be looking for them to give input to us in helping set future community-wide action items. And that will go into the next update or next uh, version of the climate action plan, which we do anticipate within the next year. And then again, uh, beginning Tuesday, should council move forward, we have information um, that will be ready to go out. Uh, and we have taken in mind, again, that this information needs to be presented at a variety of levels. We have some that are very passionate and educated already about this, and we have, will have the full uh, climate action plan available for them to view. Uh, but we will also make it in a variety of readable forms. So there will be just a, a one-pager info sheet. We even just have a, a promo card um, that's ready to go because we, of course, will want to keep to our material management and not print copies of our full climate action plan. 
Um, we will have a website that's ready to go, which you'll see is at the bottom of your screen, mesaaz.gov backslash climate action. And on that webpage is where we will be <coughs> listing all of the future meetings, laying out what those next steps are for the public. Um, so that way we are transparent about our future uh, updates to this plan and an awareness that this is going to be an evolving living document. And then, of course, there's already links then to what we're doing as it relates to those current focus areas. And then finally, uh, given that Council had their strategic initiative of healthy environments, we did create a data dashboard. Um, and this is really an effort to be more transparent as part of the city, but to give then those, again, that are, are educated and invested already into this effort, um, really some ability to go in and view the data that we have currently available. So on your screen is just a, a quick snapshot of some of the interactive data models that we have on there. Um, you're currently able to pull up that data portal and start interacting with the different fields of those metrics. And this is gonna be how Scott had mentioned, we're going to be able to have measurable um, data metrics related to those aspirational goals so that way we can begin tracking those. And now I'm gonna turn it off to Laura. To understand the city operations carbon footprint, we conducted a greenhouse gas inventory using an EPA model, the ICLE uh, local governments protocol. Uh, that provided us uh, a background uh, for the, the city's carbon footprint. We have a doctor of environmental engineering on our staff who conducted the inventory for us. And the benefits of doing that in-house will really give us the opportunity to dig into that data over time and update it as we need to. Uh, we used uh, 2019 as our baseline year because 2020 was a very unique year. Um, the inventory uh, shows us where we have opportunities and initially we'll be focusing on the five largest sectors. And we will continue to track our carbon footprint over time. City departments will be bringing forward projects and strategic investments that support climate action. Uh, the, a report for each of those projects will include feasibility and an explanation of how the project achieves or moves forward uh, achievement of those aspirational goals. The report will also provide an explanation and data of how the project uh, meets the targets that are within each focus area. Uh, the, when a project uh, is able to uh, address multiple focus areas, as Scott's described, those co-benefits will be highlighted in the report. And we will also include in the report an explanation and an understanding of how that project reduces greenhouse gas emissions in the city of Mesa. We are currently working on projects that support climate action, and one of those is multiple departments are working together on creating a roadmap that will be used to convert our uh, gas and diesel-powered light-duty fleet vehicles to electric. And as we bring finalize that project and, and put together uh, milestones for that, we'll bring that to, and other projects back to council uh, with a report. Uh, we'll just bring those to the budget hearings and to council agendas. Uh, the climate action plan will be a living document uh, as we get community input and as we achieve targets within the plan and as new technology emerges, the climate action plan will be updated. So with that, that is our presentation on, on the plan. So we're open for any questions that you may have. I think you're going to find some questions here. Uh, Council Member Spilsbury. I had to beat Jen to this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I, I just really quickly, the, um, I think, thank you so much for all the work that's gone into this. I really appreciate it. And I really like that it's a living document so that we can continually add, but I think it's important that we have something that we can put on our website, have a web page, get going, started on, refer people to. So I really appreciate that and that we'll just continue to change and evolve as, as we learn and, and grow through this. Um, this is a really small question, but on page four under heat mitigation, 
Um, prepare workforce, can you tell me what that refers to? Um, that is actually our, our safety services folks are doing that right now. So we have a lot of folks that are working in the field every single day. Uh, and if you think about a day like today, it's supposed to be 117 degrees outside today and setting another record. I think we've set records the last two days uh, for heat. Uh, it's teaching our workforce and making sure that they have an understanding um, of protecting themselves from the heat and making sure that they're hydrated and making sure that they're not getting negative health effects that are associated with that so that they are able to complete their jobs and do the jobs that they have, uh, but do that in a safe manner. Okay, do we change their to. work hours or anything to earlier? I believe there are, there are some departments like that. that do change their work hours. Um, there are some, I know in, in um, solid waste, we do provide some, some drinks and, and uh, salty snacks for them. Uh, to try and make sure that they're able to, to complete. We have some cooling vests for our folks that do bulk cleanup. So I have two folks today that will be doing 20 pickups on a rear loader, you know, picking up couches and mattresses and those sorts of things, bulk throughout the city. Um, and we give them uh, different tools for them to make sure that they're able to stay cool and stay healthy, but also be able to get their job done today. Okay, great. That's all I had. Thank you. I'll go first. Uh, <clears throat> on the slide of the carbon footprint, uh, what is the mobile construction piece there? Uh, that is mobile combustion. So that is the uh, vehicles that we have, the generators that we have, anything that emits um, green emissions of any sort. Okay. And then is this uh, the inventory? Is it that will be uh, guiding us as far as what what areas we can maybe cut? as far as that percentage, right? Or is that the idea? That is, yeah, so it, it gives us an opportunity to see where those admissions are coming from and then have specific programs or projects in place to reduce emissions in those areas. So it becomes your baseline, right? Uh, right, so this will be our, our baseline, but I think the question also is, is that this helps us then, as you see that pie chart, it delineates down whether it's, you know, vehicle emissions from employee commutes or it's mobile combustion, whatever it may be. Here's the areas in which that we can we can make progress. And it's more of a specific question around the food energy. I know the project on uh, the, uh, the the food waste uh, is that uh, just a, a quick update on that project. Uh, are we moving forward, or are we still looking at the data there? So we are moving forward with phase one is what we call it, which is flare to fuel that's taking the existing biogas at the Northwest Water Reclamation Plant and upgrading it to pipeline quality standards to fuel the solid waste vehicles. We are still working on what would be phase two of that program when we would actually do an introduction of food waste slurry into those digesters. Uh, we've, we're having a lot of conversations. There's some uh, regulatory and financial hurdles that are in the way of that. Um, the renewable fuel standard has, is where we're going to get some of the revenue associated with this project by the generation of these things that are called renewable identification numbers. When we add food waste in the way that the, the current regulation is, it devalues the gas, so it's, it's worth less money, but we're gonna have to spend more capital in order to produce that gas. We actually, I had a conference call with the department, well, it's the National uh, Renewable Energies Lab this week. Uh, the city of Mesa is working on coming up with analytical methods to show that in fact that food waste does meet the intent of the renewable fuel standards so that hopefully it's not devalued like that. Um, so that's the biggest part of what we're working on right now is we're working with the Department of Energy and the Environmental Protection Agency on if there's rule changes that we can get made for that standard, the renewable fuel standard. If we're able to do that, then it completely changes the financials of being able to do the food waste and makes it much more financially viable for us to be able to do it also. The, in addition to that, though, there's a lot of work that, that needs to be done as far as making sure that the supply we can have, it's, it's a pretty complex project. So it's gonna take time, but yes, phase one we're working on. Once that's in place, we'll be able to then quickly be able to introduce that food waste once we get everything else lined up. I might as well go. Uh, fortunately, I saved you from, by thank you for having a meeting with me prior to this meeting so I wouldn't carry on for an hour. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to touch upon a few things. Thank you for your work on the Climate Action Plan, the complete plan 
I just want to let everybody know that this is just the presentation overview, but the complete plan is on the website, like you mentioned, mesaaz.gov slash climate action, which is on the presentation. And for anybody who is interested in more of those details and those measurements and our goals, that would be the place to look and don't be disappointed by just a presentation that is just an overview. Um, so thank you for all your work on that. And I'm excited to be able to um, start on this journey of being comprehensive in our city operations and eventually uh, engaging more with the community and the businesses. Um, along those lines, and I have quite a few points, but do you have enough staff? I mean, this is a huge project and we're reaching into all departments across the city. And I, so I'm just putting out support for if you need additional staff in order to carry out this plan, I think it's important to state that um, it is a priority for what we're doing as a city and support you and staff needs. So I'll leave that. I know that's a longer conversation, but I, I do have those concerns that um, with this additional work, you already do so much amazing work that this will impact your staff needs. Um, I think that we should do a presentation to all our advisory boards in the city about sustainability. It touches everything that we do. There's such a great interest. Um, Laura did a brief presentation to the Economic Advisory Board was it last week or the week before, just kind of a general overview. Tremendous reaction and interest. I'd like to point out also that the city is sponsoring a green business program and working with Local First, where they can certify your business as a green. Uh, Local First will go into the business and look at all the ways you do things and create some efficiencies which are actually more green and sustainable and save money at the same time. And I think that is a worth, worthwhile endeavor for our businesses um, as far as their immediate contributions. Um, also, I assume that we will review all the goals annually. We've taken our, our carbon footprint and our measurements and our graphs and looking at that annually within the departments and as a whole, mm -hmm. as a city. Okay, we're gonna do that. Um, I'd like to also um, suggest, as I have, and <laughs> thank you for listening to me again, that we have a sustainability advisory board as well. I've had lots of requests from different constituent groups that they feel this is important. I know you're doing a tremendous community outreach and the survey, working with a consultant and bringing that information, but we consider that as we include that community engagement so that this tremendous interest we have from our citizens can be carried forward in everything that we do as a city. This is a long-term plan. This is something that I hope as this generation, we are looked back in 2050 as a generation that took a stance against climate change and saved our earth instead of being the consumers that we are, that we change the course of our future. And I know in order to do that, we all have to be engaged and that's one of the reasons for the advisory board. But um, this is how important it is. It's in, um, who we are as a people for future generations. Also, I'd like to point out that in the lens of equity, which has become so, so important as we have gone through COVID and has uncovered so many inequalities that we have and the environmental justice, that the people who are most affected by climate change are the ones who contribute the least. They are not they don't have multiple cars. They don't buy, they're not the big consumption citizens. They, and everything that we're going through through heat and the costs and the impacts in our environment are felt most by those who are just, uh, just surviving and not thriving in our community. Um, 
I think that's about all, but I just um, thank you very much for all your work on this. I look forward to working with you going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Mr. Freeman? I'll make a couple, Mayor. Uh, you know, Vice Mayor, I did have the same concern. Each one of you staff members have responsibilities, and you're working on this specific topic with other staff, and it takes a lot of time, so I appreciate that. One of the things I thought that we need to be strategic and probably working with our third-party vendors. Uh, you know, we have vendors that come into the city and we do business with, and how are they implementing their programs to, you know, their carbon footprint, everything that you discussed, and, and that that acquiescence into what we're doing as a city and municipality. So I think that's important that we, we make sure that they're doing their part, we're doing our part. And then the one thing that concerns me is, you know, are there going to be additional costs to our utility users, you know, when we implement programs like this? Because, you know, things aren't getting any cheaper. You know, vendors are raising the cost of their supplies and, and we're having to, uh, you know, pay extra monies. But I guess as a, as a community, as a city, are are we willing to pay more in our utility bills to be, you know, climate conscious, to say it that way? So that's another thing that you'll have to leverage and uh, think about. Well, we all will, and as a council, we'll probably have to make that decision. You know, at some point, um, do we ask uh, people to for more money on their utility bills? And I, I know utility costs are going up, so I don't know what we're paying for energy today, but. Uh, you know, we buy electricity from uh, outside providers, and, you know, that's an important concept. And so with that, I'll just say that uh, our collaborations with others are important. So let's uh, look into that, too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Mr. Luna, are you looking to comment on this? Uh, yes, Mayor. I'm having a little bit of audio problems, so I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, first of all, I want to thank staff for this climate action plan. It's something that is of interest to my community. I know in District 5, so I appreciate it. And so I was wondering, um, as we develop this wonderful framework, are we going to be sharing this with uh, the school districts as well as our larger employees that the city of Mesa is engaged in developing this plan and would like them to participate as well? You want me to answer that? You want me to? Yes, thank you, Council Member Luna, Council. Um, we will certainly be throughout the summer, that's gonna be part of the educational awareness campaign related to the Climate Action Plan itself um, that hopefully will begin Tuesday, should, should this go through with the resolution. Um, the city manager has been um, already begun distributing information through department directors and we'll certainly make sure that's a priority for the remainder of the workforce within. And then to relate to Mesa Public Schools and the youth, again, we know that that is such a um, important voice to be able to engage. So uh, we will certainly be able to connect with Mesa Public Schools. Thank you for that input. Um, and then when we go to the point of having those focus group conversations, um, tentative right now for the fall time, uh, we'll be looking to get that notification out um, through the schools as well. So thank you for that input. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments? Uh, I just want to add my thanks. Uh, I know that we've asked you to do this really, I think, just starting in January. And so I, I have to say I'm, I'm really grateful and, and impressed with the, the, the ground that we've covered in that amount of time and, and how uh, far we've gotten. So, so thank you so much, and Andrea and Laura and Scott. I know you've all invested a lot of time, as have others in this. So thank you. Uh, I, I, my initial reaction to this was I, I, I didn't know if we were putting the cart in front of the horse by adopting the resolution on Monday and then engaging in, you know, going to community engagement. I thought perhaps do we need to engage the community to develop the plan and, and then adopt it. But, uh, but I've, I've come around on that because I think part of the plan, you know, one, one of the pillars of your plan is community engagement. Uh, and so the, uh, I th those in the community that want to have their voices heard on this, that's part of the plan. Uh, and and so I, I and as you've said several times, it's a living document. And and if we get feedback from the from the community that we think ought to be a part of the plan, we'll we'll make changes. Um, and I do think that the other the other pillars of the plan are pretty uh, mainstream and straightforward. And I don't think they're uh, uh, they're questionable. I mean, it, it puts us really in the mainstream of of 
organizations and cities that are uh, responsibly responding to, uh, to this crisis. Uh, carbon neutrality by 2050 and getting halfway there by 2030, I think, is just kind of a global standard, as is uh, renewable energy by 2050 and 90% reduction in landfill by 2050. Uh, those are, I don't know if those, how attainable those are. That, that, I, I hope they are. I think that's part of this plan is to go out and say these are not just uh, aspirational goals that we don't have a plan to, to make real progress on. Um, but uh, I, I think they're, they're going to be challenging. Um, so um, thanks again. I, I get, and the thing that I like about it is this is not a climate action bookshelf plan. It's a climate action action plan, right? And, and, and so uh, I know Andrea is going to do a great job of reaching out to the business community, to the school districts, to everyone that needs to be a, a partner with the city of Mesa to, for this to be a meaningful uh, movement in our community. So uh, I'm looking forward to voting for this on Monday night and, and think it's the right way to go. Mayor? Yes. So can, I, can I just clarify kind of how we see the plan and how it relates to the implementation. Um, while uh, Scott and Laura and Andrea have done a really good job of bringing this together and pulling all the pieces together and coordinating with the departments, the implementation of this plan doesn't happen by Scott or Laura or Andrea. It happens by the departments. It happens by the individuals that are out in the field making decisions about you know, vehicles and purchasing vehicles. We've already put it in our request for light duty electric vehicles you know, now. So those are, what they help is kind of pull it all together and, and help facilitate and encourage and um, be informative and be the, you know, kind of the in-house experts. But we have, every department has its role to do. So when we talk about how is this going to get done, it's going to get done in the department level. It's going to be done in purchasing. It's going to be done in you know, decisions we make about how we go about um, our operations and the energy consumption, you're going to get a briefing on energy. Uh, costs are going up, um, not by 10 percent, not by 30 percent, by hundreds of percents right now, today. Um, what, 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 is, what we have to cost to purchase power is um, more than we ever historically in the city. Um, you're seeing rolling brownouts in California and Texas and so we pay the premium on that. So energy is going to be really important, but that's being done in the energy department every day. So we will, I think what helps is to have this focal point, have the story that's being told, and put the plan together so the departments understand the role, their role and what they can do. And then one thing I want to be very clear about, and Scott said this, um, this is not, I don't want anybody to think, oh, Mace is finally doing climate action plan. It's finally getting into the business. We've been doing this for a long time. And I think what, unfortunately, this plan um, suggests is like a beginning. It's really the continuation of many things that we've been doing um, that Scott's worked on, on solar, on waste reuse, and just over and over again, shade uh, studies. So we have a lot of work that's been done. And this is, I think, formalizing it and putting it out front. And that's why we're excited to be able to get this online and out there so the community can really see um, our commitment of what we've done and our commitment going forward, and now bring and then having a formal um, forum to bring the community into the discussion um, because there's a lot of different ideas out there and trying to find a way to funnel that in and benefit from uh, the interests of our community. So thanks. Thank you, Mr. Brady. And I'll amend what I said earlier. We did not start working on this in January. What I mean is we started this, writing this down and documenting what we have done and what we're going to do. So uh, I am proud of what we did before January as well. Mr. Freeman. So I just heard we're going to buy some electric fire trucks. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Reddy. Mr. Brady, on the process, is there, is it, too much to ask if within the council reports, maybe the the, the projects that are coming in uh, that look at reducing uh, the uh, carbon footprint of how much or some, a section there of how we uh, like the the fleet uh, the fleet going into electric if that comes in, uh, how much that uh, just to have it top of mind and have. Uh, I guess transparency on those types of projects to note yeah. that in the council report, or, or if there's a 
another way to yeah. put that type of information where okay. we we have. I think we do it multiple ways, whether it's the like update or on the updating the, the climate action plan. Um, probably during the budget, you'd see it too. So we'll wherever the opportunity, we'll try to highlight those um, initiatives. Yeah, we can do that. I don't know if it's too late to amend the resolution at this point, but I, I would be nice that you, uh, I mean, progress happens when you measure things, right? And so it would be nice to have built into this, baked into the, to Mr. Heredia's point, you know, a return and report part to this where every year at a minimum or so we're, we're hearing, hey, we're expert, here's what we've accomplished. Here's the math that, you know, we, we can measure the, the impact of these goals that we've had on our our aspirational goal of getting to certain places by 2030 and 2050. Because like I say, my, my biggest fear is that this becomes something we mm -hmm. talked about in, in June of 2021 and it goes on a shelf and uh, it, it doesn't get implemented. Uh, Vice Mayor. Um, I just had a few more comments about that. That although where we're starting is addressing the city of Mesa as an entity, as a government, and what we're doing and making our progress, that this plan has to be citywide with residents, businesses. We have five, over 500,000 people living in our city and a city of our size, the second largest in Arizona, 35th largest in the United States. There's a responsibility to take this on comprehensively because what we can accomplish together is tremendous in changing our climate. And I, I'm so proud that we are being a leader in doing that with a city our size. I know other cities have done that, but the impact that we can make because of the pure size is monumental. And regarding the energy costs, yes, they're rising. One of the reasons that they're rising is because the increased demand why the increased demand is that we're experiencing a global warming. We have heat across the nation, record heat. We're experiencing, used to be, we would have record heat, right? But there are record, there's record heat across the nation. The demand is so strong, and that is because of the climate change and the way that we live are creating this environment. So is a result. So yes, we'd like to have less expensive, electricity, but until we change our climate, that's the demand for energy will be soaring. So I just wanted to make that statement. Thank you. Thank you. And so again, I'm going to offer the suggestion that we amend the resolution to include a, a provision that there, at, at, at a minimum on an annual basis, the council get an update on the progress that's being made. Um, so if that can be incorporated before Monday, that would be my recommendation. All right, Council, any other questions on this item? Thank you so much. I hope you, uh, you felt the love for uh, your, your hard work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next item, item 2B, is to hear a presentation and discuss proposed modifications to an approved smart growth community plan to allow a mixed-use transit-oriented development located east of Dobson Road and north of Main Street. The keyboard doesn't work, so everything is so sort of nice. Jeff and Nana, good to see you. Good to see you. Good morning, Mayor, Council. Um, Jeff and I are here to give you a presentation on a modification to a smart growth community plan that was approved in 2016. As you're looking at um, the slide, the property is located on the corner, well, eastern part of Dobson and north of Main Street. Um, it's 21 acres. And this was approved back in 2016. There, there was a lengthy discussion when this project was actually going through the public review process. And the basic request was to zone the 21 acres from general and limit, um, limited commercial and infill district two to a smart growth community. And I'll go through that details later on after Jeff give the background. Um, 
the zoning district will, in the form-based code or the smart goal community that is referred to as transect, basically those are zoning district. That was approved back in 2016. The modifications that we're going to be discussing with you, those zoning designations on the property have not changed. It remains the same. Before I go into the details of what they are proposing and all the changes, we felt it's very important to give you the background of what transpired, all the discussion that took place before the project was approved. So with that, I'll pass it on to Jeff. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, just to give you a, a quick summary, uh, there's about five or six years of history on this site. So we thought it'd be a good idea to give you a, some context of how we got to where we are today. Uh, not unmentioned, this is a, overall the project site is about 21 acres. Of that 21 acres, approximately 10 acres is currently the Sycamore Station Park and Ride and Transit Center. Uh, that that transit center and park and ride was purchased. I'm sorry, not a, it wasn't purchased. A lease was purchased. A, a capitalized lease of about 56 years was purchased using FTA dollars, and the park and ride and transit center was developed using those with those FTA funds. Um, there is currently about 41 years left on that lease. Now, in 2015, when the Central Mesa extension opened and moved the beginning of of the line park and ride to Mesa Drive, demand at the Sycamore Station park and ride reduced significantly. It's about a 850 space parking lot. Um, at the By the time we were working through this development proposal, um, Valley Metro had reduced their required um, amount of parking to just under 200 spaces. So there was a significant reduce in, reduction in um, the demand for the par parking lot uh, that allowed us to be able to entertain redevelopment options. Um, go ahead. The, the developer, Mira Vista, uh, approached the city um, with an overall um, development plan since they own the, the remaining 11 acres on both sides, the south and to the west of the city's park and ride. They came to the city with an overall development plan um, that we had entertained um, that was um, the reason that led to the original zoning request. That original zoning request did require a development agreement with the city not only because of the zoning, but maybe more importantly, because the city's interest in that park and ride was being included as part of the overall development plan. In addition, because the park and ride was purchased and improved with FTA dollars, that did require that there was a certain amount of fair share, uh, as FTA um, describes it, that is reinvested back into transit as the, the site is redeveloped. That was approximately just under $4 million that the project needed to incorporate into to the development, and that included um, much of what our development agreement negotiated, included the uh, new park and ride facility, so re redeveloping the park and ride and providing covered parking. It included new bus bay improvements on Main Street that, that would replace the transit center and the, the operations there, included an operator restroom, um, demolition of, of, you know, the the it's the closed public restroom that's there now, but one of the most dangerous restrooms in the city of Mesa um, was the demolition, and Jody Sorrell was had negotiated specifically that she got to swing the first um, sledgehammer, um, but so far that hasn't happened. Um, so that was the, the real main intent of our development agreement. Um, we understand that there are, there are some neighborhood um, or groups that are concerned with this project um, and believe that uh, that commitments made by the developer are not being met. Um, I cannot speak to the commitments made to the developer as we did not participate in those, those neighborhood meetings, but I can tell you from our perspective on the negotiations of the development agreement, we were not negotiating whether or not um, the townhome piece needed to be for sale units or for rent units. That was not a, uh, an element of our development agreement. And we were not negotiating um, necessarily the requirement that the townhome units be the first phase of development. In fact, it was specific that the Main Street piece would likely be the first phase of development because we needed to be able to maintain the park and ride operations while construction happened. So it was, in, in order to maintain park and ride, we needed to allow development to happen that included a new parking structure, then that would allow the next phase to replace the existing surface park and light. Um, the integral nature of the transit center, particularly to the first phase of development on Main Street, 
um, really made it so that the developer had to work with the underlying fee owner property. Um, with only 40, at the time, 43 or 44 years left on a lease, that was not enough um, economic life. We, as the city of Mesa, through our lease, had all rights of ownership. That, that's the reason that we were able to go through the rezoning process, and that we could and the reason we could develop on the site. We could have entered into an agreement with the developer to actually develop on the site with what the, the time remaining on the lease, but with 40, just over 40 years left on the lease, it was not an economically feasible project to be able to, to develop. So they were working in good faith to negotiate the ownership of the fee simple, fee simple ownership of the underlying land. Um, and I can, I can confirm, uh, I personally spoke with the family's representative, the underlying ownership family. I spoke with their um, representative multiple times, as did um, Kim Fallback, our real estate administrator. We provided them all the information about the development proposal, all the information of the FTA requirements that actually really were the, much of the driving factor behind um, our development agreement as well as shared an appraisal that the city had commissioned well before um, uh, as we began the com conversations with the developer. Um, unfortunately, um, the underlying um, landowners' um, expectations for land value were significantly higher than, than the develop development could um, bear, um, which really has been the reason, the crux of the reason why we are here now to, to discuss a, a modification to that smart growth community plan, um, so particularly because the, the site layout had to change um, because the transit center was not included and I really needed to have the master plan reconsidered to be able to be still be an integral part and can be looked at as an overall master plan. Um, I think at that point, um, <laughs> I think I've got us up to speed. So I think I, you know, I, how we've got to where we are today, what's necessitated the rezoning, and now I'll hand it back to Nana so we can describe what the rezoning actually includes. Mayor Council, so the rezoning back in 2016 was from the limited general commercial and infield district to, to smart grow community planning. Just to give you just a quick overview of a smart grow community plan. It's very similar to the form-based code transit district or the zoning district. Whenever you have a property that is outside the form-based code area, so we do have a map, which is basically an area for the form-based code. In, a, in the city, you have the opportunity to basically carry the same standard regulations, the goals, within the form-based code area into another area. But to be able to do that, you need to go through what we call the smart growth community plan. And some of the basic requirements is you have to demonstrate that there is a pedestrian share. It's basically your transportation network, the distance it takes for people to walk, which is typically five minutes, and it should not be within um, less than a quarter mile to a transit station. And also your zoning district, which is a transit, you have to show your thoroughfares, so basically your road network and civic spaces. What they intend here is really to achieve a complete community where it's very walkable, people can walk, it's, it's got so many civic spaces where people can actually play. So once the um, small group community is approved by city council, the next level is final development plan. And that final development plan actually follows very much as to the uh, form-based code where that is approved administratively. By the time it gets to the final development plan, council and the community would have all reviewed and basically agreed on the parameters of the development, the zoning designations, all the elements that make up the plan. So with particular to this site, the site is actually located in a mixed-use activity district. Um, uh, and the goal of the mixed use activity district is basically to allow us to allow development of mixed use communities also actually located in our transit district and the west main street area all these sub area plans are basically intended to really establish a mixed use community where it's very transit um well it's walkable pedestrian friendly as even previously we we're talking about a climate action plan the goal here is to minimize work up. I mean, people driving from one location to the other, being able to walk to various sectors to really obtain their services. 
So the zoning designations, as you see here, that has not changed from the 2016. If you look at this map, it shows what we call the T5N, T4N. The city parcel is, of this look, is in this location. All the uses, which includes townhomes and other uses, that remains the same. The zoning hasn't changed, and it's so the request is so for it to remain the same. So this is the plan that was approved back in 2016. If you look here, it shows the city parcel and then the other um, parcels, which Jeff has more information about this. The request before you is to remove this parcel line that you're seeing here. And the intent is for it to be able to develop as one parcel and also change the configuration. If you look at the previous configuration, the building footprint actually included the city parcel area. But to be able to get this project moving forward, it's very important for it to be kind of separated in a way so that parcel that the developer doesn't own can move forward. So if you look at this, there is also no proposed changes to permitted land uses, as I was saying, again, on the parcel, on the city parcel, the same as the other parcels as well. So we kind of bulleted item or specific things that the modification is actually asking for. It's just modification to the parcel configuration, parking standards, as Jeff was saying earlier on. In the initial plan, there was discussion about the parking garage. We don't need that again. And then there is also pedestrian and ve vehicular thoroughfare. The original plan that was approved in 2016 was very much specific to your thoroughfare layout. That was a little bit different from the intent of the preliminary development plan because that is kind of an overarching plan. You really get to know the very details when you come in with a um, final development plan. And that has been some of the challenges as they are modifying their um, building orientation and all that. They've run into this issue where it was so detailed where they want to modify the road network. And we are saying, well, that it's actually a major modification. It needs to come to council. So what they are doing is we're laying, out the, we're laying down the parameters. But once we have a specific site plan, then we'll be able to know the width of the street and all that based on the type of development. And again, it's very similar to the building form where the transect or the zoning actually lays out the specific standard or the requirements, and that is actually determined when they come in with an actual site plan. And again, Jeff spoke about the removal of the development agreement, which was a condition of approval that is no longer needed. I know at the Planning and Zoning Board recently, or the past year and a half, one of the discussions that we continue to have with the Planning and Zoning Board and other community members is impact of especially multifamily development um, on schools. So whenever we get any development application, especially for multifamily and single family, we do send it out to the school district to receive their input, whether they have adequate capacity to service the development. So we did send it out and we got this information back. They do have adequate capacity to service the development. My understanding is before the plan got approved in 2016, there was an extensive public participation and discussion. And even after that, the developer has so been engaging the community. Um, they did send out a notification as well that made a uh, notification requirement. But during the hearing, the first hearing in April, a planning and zoning board, the, there were a couple of representatives from Mesa, the Mesa Granite Group who requested to meet with a developer because they were not aware of the most recent changes. And so the planning and zoning board continued the case to May for the developer to go and meet with the Mesa Grande group. So my understanding and from information we received from the developer, they met on May 4th to discuss the proposed changes. This I'm sure all of you are very familiar with this site. Um, this is a couple of pictures. So based on the findings of the general plan and the zoning ordinance, the smart growth community plan requirements, this proposal that will be coming before you meets all the requirements and the goals of the general plan. 
The plan and zoning board did recommend approval before you and staff will be recommending approval. With that, we will be ready for any questions you have. Okay, I know we've got several questions. So PNZ recommended approval. This is not on our agenda for Monday, but it's uh, it's on the horizon. Okay, Mayor Council, that's correct. July 1st. July 1st. And May, yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Thompson, then Mr. Reddy, and then we'll work our way over here. I was trying to, I was looking at this the other day, and I was trying to rack through my brain from back in 2015-16, and, and, and I remember the discussion we had on this, because this was one of the properties, Mayor, I think was um, originally there were two sites in Mesa that a developer wanted to develop and bring the subsidized housing into, and, and this was one of them. And because of the, uh, at the time, uh, the Sycamore Station had the highest on and off rates, of any station on light rail. And so uh, the, the council pushed back, I think it was a 6-1 vote um, at the time to push back against the residential. And we wanted to make sure that they were, because of the, the high volume of people utilizing Sycamore Station, we wanted to make sure that we were keeping the commercial retail component um, forward facing. Uh, and, and pushing more of the, the apartment and the, the market rate stuff to the back of the property. Is that still what we're wanting to do in, with this approved or modified plan? Are we still uh, wanting the commercial and retail more forward-facing streetwise, uh, pushing more of the multifamily stuff towards the back of the property? Mayor, Councilmember Thompson, you are actually taking the history back even further than I, <laughs> I did. Um, I, I, we did, um, uh, the, that Main Street piece um, that is not part of the park and ride, that was, there was a, a low income tax credit housing developer that owned that piece and had a development proposal for a mixed use residential with some commercial. They were in, unsuccessful, I can't remember if it was 2013, 2014 range in getting their tax credit. And so they, they had a parcel that, that they, they couldn't develop. That's when Mira Vista purchased it from them and started coming and having conversations with us. From, a, from an overall development proposal, yes, that the idea is to push the intensity to Main Street and put the, the, the townhomes with more single family type development further back where it's more, more into a neighborhood type setting closer to that school. Okay, perfect, thank you. Thank you. I think uh, this, uh, this specific item I think it was the first couple of weeks that I came on council that I got briefed on <laughs> uh, and so since then it's been kind of in the development conversation phase and uh, from from what I know and been briefed and over the years it has been you know the the plan has has not really changed as far as the the configuration I think the designs and uh, that making its way through the process uh, on Main Street has components on some some lower level uh, uh, commercial pieces that I think makes sense uh, for Main Street on the side of Dobson. I think it's more uh, uh, the market rate uh, apartments, but uh, and know oh, the the slide on the school analysis what we what I've encountered uh, in various different developments, including this one, that usually schools are, uh, especially in West Mesa, schools are actually not just wanting, ca having capacity, but actually wanting more kids, right? Because of the struggling kid enrollment that we have in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, our, in our public schools. And so that's, that's something that I, I think also plays a part into conversations. And, and I think the biggest thing is not being able to get the sale of the park and ride, which right now I'm fairly really familiar with this space because I travel there all the time. And it's it's a lonely parking lot. There's probably five to eight cars on a given day there. And it's it's probably un, really unsafe at this moment uh, as far as uh, the activity that's happening there. And it's right next to a school, unfortunately, uh, Webster. Uh, and I know the developer has been working with the school and trying to figure out there's there's a rec the recreation center there and figuring out the the transportation piece or drop off and and I think that uh, they they've I don't know if you can update that piece uh, but just to further along I think this is the uh, 
the, the, the concerns of, of having market rate apartments in this section, I, I think are valid. Um, but I, I think it's, it's an important uh, piece that we need to leverage and build density on based on the assets that we have, such as light rail, the, the, the branding piece that we're adding as a Asian district there. I, I have other uh, residents and uh, folks that are actually wanting new product to be able to live near the Asian district, to, to, tra to walk across the street to Mekong, H Mart, and have uh, an, uh, an opportunity to live there and utilize public uh, and transit and transportation modes that we have in this area. I think that's, that's, a, that's an important aspect uh, of what I think this corner can be as a place-making opportunity for, or for our city uh, and have more people live there, improving uh, that section of, of our city uh, and, and, and leveraging assets that we are paying, right? Like light rail and other transit modes. And so I, I think I, per my comments, I, I'm, I'm supportive of this, of this change and, and this project based on, on those components. I understand the, the, uh, the concerns here and, and our hope is to continue, I think, to see what we can do with that transit center area uh, that is, it's currently not available, but uh, in, in, in the future, if there is an opportunities to, to have potentially for sale product there, I think would be recommended, of course, and, and push uh, strongly. Uh, but as far as the configuration and the, the proposals that are coming in for that Main Street and the Dobson piece and how we are making these changes to, to, this, uh, to this plan, I think it's, it makes sense uh, as we as we continue to build the corridor, uh, at least west of downtown, where the type of quality of this product that's coming in is something that I don't think we have in the city of Mesa uh, currently, right? So um, that's my comments there. Okay, thank you. Ma Mayor? Mayor? It's Mr. Luna. Me. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Thompson and I were on council during the time where this discussions uh, relative to low income tax credit housing, there was somewhat controversial in that area and the, uh, the burden that it would impose on school districts. And we certainly under currently now we know that we have declining enrollments in and around the school districts in that area and having market rate housing is going to be an added plus. Uh, I do like the proposal. I like the way it's already set up. I think uh, I'm going to be supportive of this. I think we should move forward on this. And uh, it, it's it, it's time to go ahead and, and, and make it happen because uh, it's been over five, six years, uh, Mr. Thompson, correct me, uh, when we had this discussion. And I think uh, we're ready to move on with this. So I'm going to be supportive of this, Mayor. Okay. Thank you. I, I do have a, a question. The, the actual, the modification, I believe, has been made necessary because the developer wasn't able to acquire one of the pieces of this larger piece. And, and, and it, my understanding, is that I remember also the beginning of this project and, and the fact that the, the neighborhood was actually very warm to this idea. And part of what they liked about it was the owner-occupied residential. And my understanding is the rub here is that the part that was designated for owner-occupied is the part that hasn't been able to be acquired. Am I understanding things? Is that correct, Mayor Council? That, that absolutely correct. Uh, the I can I can confirm the developer worked in true good faith with the, the underlying property owner. Um, the demands uh, they they offered well above appraised value. The demanded value that was, that the property owner wanted was five times that. Um, and in addition to that, add on top of that nearly $4 million of FTA fair share that needed to be included into the development that they had to absorb as overall development cost. It became, you know, it just became unfeasible from an economic perspective to continue. So that's when we, we suspended our negotiations on the development agreement, which led to the, the, the need for the modifications. Um, going forward, though, we, 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 we have discussed, um, um, Christine Zalanka and Jody Sorrell and I, we've discussed the idea of we have open communications. We've had communications with the underlying property owner. We, would, we want to see the townhome portion of this 
project happen as well. Um, we can continue to try and have dialogue with that property owner, see whether they would ever be interested in partnering with the city to see whether we can find a and partner and find another development partner that could go forward with this project. So, Jeff, on the, on the diagram that we're looking at, what, what, what's the piece of property that we're describing that, the, that, that has not been incorporated? Okay. It, that's a fairly large, well, I'm sorry. I, I'm going to ask the question again. What, what part of this, I, I see the, 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 the dotted outline. It's the area inside of the dotted outline. So, so that entire piece. Yes. So it's pretty, it's very large. Prox approximately 10 acres. Okay, so that's the part that's owned by the family that uh, that we can't reach, haven't reached terms with, or the developer hasn't. So you can see by not having that, it really bifurcates the whole development. Right. So it changes the whole dynamic. So that's why they have to come back. And it's a half or more of the entire project. Okay. And that lease, you know, every year gets. Um, smaller and smaller, so the feasibility of putting development on an existing lease doesn't, you know, it, economics don't work. Every year it gets worse because the, the, lease, the leasehold interest gets shorter. So what we have to offer, I mean, it's, it doesn't work economically. It works when it's maybe closer to 50 years, but it doesn't work when it's closer to 30 years. The, the upside is, though, however, the FTA fair share that the needs to be reinvested back into transit is based on a depreciation model. So every year that, that, that nothing happens here, the, the improvements on the property depreciate, and so the FTA fair share reduces. So as time goes on, there could be a balancing act that happens so you still have there. to convince a property owner to do yes, the deal. Yes, correct. That's, that's what I'm suggesting. But. No so matter what, though, the important thing to note is the, the zoning entitlement that, that, that's shown on that screen, the, the townhomes, the, the transect zones, those are there. Um, regardless of, of when this happens, anybody to change that from townhomes to something else would have to go through a rezoning process through, through P&Z and council. Okay, so the developer's pitch is, uh, we have master planned this, we're waiting for this other property to come into the fold. Uh, the, the property owner right now doesn't have a lot of motivation because they're receiving Rent payments, are they? It, Mayor, it was a capitalized lease, so they received got their entire oh, they payment got it up, up front. front. They've already been paid, okay. Well, I, uh, this is a complicated deal, that, but we would love to see this happen. It's a very strategic piece of property with all of the amazing activity going on around it with the, uh, the demand for residential, the proximity to the Asian district. Uh, our desire to help Webster Elementary School. I'm an alumni of a Webster Elementary School. I would love to be there to, to, to see this, uh, to help Jody knock down the, 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 the bathroom and, and cut the ribbon on this. Um, but I, and I appreciate P and Z uh, slow walking this, saying go back and talk to the neighbors. Uh, and I guess that's kind of where I am as well. So Mr. Brady and I have talked in the last month or two about some controversial zoning cases that I think would, would benefit from the use of a mediator, where we try to get a pr problem solver involved and try to, to help everyone feel a little bit better about uh, uh, finding common solutions. This, to me, seems like another situation where we need to offer some reassurances to the neighbors that uh, we're not you know, doing a bait and switch. But you know, five, six years ago, when, we, when they were enthusiastic about this, this proposal, um, and now all of a sudden the things they liked about it are gone, or they think that they're gone. We, we, need, to, we need to respect uh, the concerns of the, of the neighborhood. So I'm, I'm anxious to see this move forward, uh, but I'm also anxious for us to, uh, to, to try to engage again and resolve some of the issues, some of the ongoing concerns of the neighbors. So uh, I'll, be, I'll be talking to them, of course, but. Uh, I can't guarantee that by the 1st of July that my, my concerns will be resolved. Uh, Ms. Billsbury and then Mr. Freeman. I just want to echo, I really liked the mediator idea when I heard about it because I don't know what it exactly looks like or entails, but in my short time on council so far, this seems to be the biggest issue is neighborhoods against developers and feeling like the city's working against them. and you know, a winner and a loser, and we, we want to work towards the compromise. And so I like having a third-party mediator that could maybe come in and help on some of these issues and get the whole story, 
because a lot of times the whole story is not presented in these situations. So I just wanted to put my support in for that. Mr. Freeman. Thank you, Mayor. I echo some of your concerns. And, you know, as I look at the carve out here at the park and ride in the transit center, is that still developable uh, for future development? Um, you know, it concerns me that everything comes off maybe Sycamore. Uh, can they access through the shopping center into the into those parcels? You know, Jeff, any comments on that? Um, Mayor, uh, Councilmember Freeman, overall, the the, the, the access points that come off of, say, Dobson that goes through, transects through the site to the transit center, the, um, that's still there. It has to be maintained as part of any future development. The, so the Dobson parcel, um, that will still have that access, goes straight over the park and ride. Coming off of Main Street, I think that's called Ironwood, um, going into the park and ride, that access point is always maintained throughout the development proposal. proposal. Also, the same, off of Sycamore, there is a, a current access drive that was always, will always be maintained. So throughout, the access through, through the site has always been maintained. And, and, and I think Nana and, uh, can speak to this a little bit better. The, one of the reasons that we're going through the rezoning is to have that reconfiguration, particularly on the Main Street side, because that the, the, that transit center is like the, the finger of the city parcel that comes down. That's the one that really is where the overlap is. So as this shows, the, the intent is to show that you can develop on the privately held land, and when the transit center does come available, that there is a developable piece that would be able to incorporate from a master planning perspective into that, that original development. I think in the past, too, we talked about if the the parking area was uh, not utilized anymore and, and development happened, they'd have to put in a parking garage. Would that still be the case, or is that prior conversations? Um, um, Councilmember Freeman, when we, when we first started this conversation back in 2015, 2016, Valley Metro was, was, was more protective of the park and ride. And I, at that time, I think they wanted somewhere around 300 parking spaces. And that's where we had a parking deck, because we wanted to minimize the land area. As we got into more analysis of the actual demand, and, and if you go out and see it today, the demand is, is 20 cars, maybe. Less than that? Five, yesterday. Five. Um, so, it, by the time we got done, we, we agreed that it would be just under 200 parking spaces because, you know, we want to plan and be able to prepare in case there is more demand. But um, 200 spaces you could fit onto the same size parcel, um, about an acre that would be rough for park and ride without the need for a structure. So at that point, we, we, we pivoted from doing a structured parking to covered parking for the park and ride. I guess my last question is uh, on, on slide six, it says final development plans are approved through administrative zoning and clearance review. Is that Nana? Mayor Council, that's correct. But the form based code or the smart community plan, what you are approving, you are approving strict parameters and guidelines that the developer absolutely has to follow. So building form, the type of buildings, the type of uses that are going to go in. So basically you are approving kind of a checklist for the developer to follow for staff to administratively approve it. But the answer is yes, that will be administrative approval. Okay. And, you know, I've gotten an email from some of the committee members that, with a lot of angst about this project and how the developers misled them and, and changed their whole development plan. So um, I hope there's some reach out to them. Uh, I forwarded on to Council Member Heredia's office. So, you know, I think communication is the key here and how, how things morph into what was and what it is today. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll look forward to this presentation or vote sometime in July. <clears throat> yeah, I think we're going to have a lot of discussion prior to that, and hopefully it will, it will come together. Uh, and uh, but So thank you. Council, any other questions or concerns on this, on this agenda item? Thank you very much. Next item on our agenda item, <clears throat> excuse me, item 2C is appointments to various boards and committees. Uh, is there a motion to that effect? Thank you, Mr. Thompson, seconded by Mr. Heredia. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. That, aye. Thank you, Mr. Luna. That passes unanimously. Next item is to knowledge receipt of minutes of various boards and committees. Uh, and I, just specifically, this is the sustainability and transportation committee meeting held on April the 8th of this year. Uh, motion by Mr. Thompson, seconded by Mr. Heredia, I bet. Thank you. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. aye.
Thank you. Uh, Aye. Any opposed? That passed unanimously as well. Next item is current event summary, including meetings and conferences intended. Council, Ms. Billsbury. It's been a good week. Um, Council member Freeman and I went to the Natural History Museum and got to see an update on the exhibit that will be open in July. There's lots of great things happening there. That was fun. Um, and then Vice Mayor Duff and I were able to go do a um, tour of the forensics lab. And that was so fascinating. I learned a ton. I could have stayed there for hours and there was just, it was really neat. And um, one thing I loved learning was that 70% of the employees are female. So that's pretty cool. I didn't know that about forensics. Um, and then last night, my assistant and I got to go and volunteer at Paz de Cristo and it was a little bit warm, but it was super cool to see what was going on there. and be a part of that and so I'm just putting out a shout out to volunteer there's so many different ways even in this hot summer to go and help and give back to the community and that's a great place to go do it I'm gonna go take a bunch of youth from my church to go do it too it was really a neat experience so that's it for me that's great are they still doing pick pick up bags at pause they are they did a drive-through and a walk-up and then in July their dining room will be back open okay. so that, and I'm sure they'll appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> it was Great. hot. It's nice if you can, it, usually the, the volunteer slots at Paws are sold, sought after, you know, you have to schedule it a year in advance. So that's, that's, that's great. Other uh, comments, council? Madam Vice Mayor. Yes, I'll, um, I wanna add on a few things. Uh, this past week, last Thursday, the mayor and I attended a Sister Cities board meeting to recognize their anniversary for 40 years, and we look forward to their anniversary celebration. Um, I also participated in the Local First Dining for Dreams program, and it's a part of the Restaurant Entrepreneur Boot Camp, but on my Local First, it teaches um, people how to use a commercial kitchen and create their model for a restaurant. It's operated out of El Rancho, and um, it was yummy as usual, and um, I thank them for that program in our community, and especially in downtown. And also, I wanted to wish everybody a happy Juneteenth, celebrating um, the, marking the end of slavery on June 19th in 1865. Tomorrow night in downtown Mesa, Zen Nights will be holding a festival in which we'll be celebrating uh, this holiday and the mayor and I will be um, visiting. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Ms. Pillsbury. Um, Councilor Freeman reminded me that I had my first official ribbon cutting in my district that I got to be a part of. <laughs> Thanks for the reminder. That was really fun. It's Exterior Plus, and they're on Velvet and Southern, and um, they were great. It was a super great group of guys. They're working and, and doing great things in our community. So. That's great. <coughs> Any other comments? Mr. Tom? Mayor? Uh, th yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Luna. Mayor? Yes. Go ahead, David. Uh, yes, uh, last Thursday I participated in a, uh, last last uh, Thursday I participated in a plan sign interview where I uh, spoke on the hydration stations, uh, monsoon preparedness and tips, uh, COVID vaccination sites at the convention center, as well as the FCC broadband internet uh, discounted program. That was a live interview. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Yeah, I had this week. I had a. Uh, Arizona League of Cities and Towns Transportation Infrastructure and Public Works Committee meeting. Uh, we talked about, uh, or we actually had a presentation by the Coalition Against Big Trucks, and also um, there was a group that wanted to set up a uh, action, I guess, committee to talk about uh, rural transportation needs. Um, and I had a discussion last night with um, our Chamber of Commerce CEO on the Mesa Veteran Program, uh, setting up a scholarship fund for veterans through the Mesa Chamber of Commerce. And then uh, tomorrow night we have the uh, PD Academy graduation. So looking forward to that. Thank you. Mr. Freeman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yesterday morning I was able to go to our envir environmental services and our solid waste workers and give them some treats. But also Mesa Fire was there presenting an award for two uh, solid waste workers who prevented a fire at a home in the on the East Valley there and so we appreciated their efforts at using their fire extinguishers so it was uh, 
uh, 5 30 in the morning yesterday with with crews and then they went right out and collected solid waste and they're, they're anxious to get out the door aren't they oh they're ready to <laughs> rock and roll thank you thank you uh i uh the last our meeting last week i know we talked about the prop 400 extension and and all the activity that's going on at mag i just want you to know we're, we're now meeting uh, I, I do represent this council at the uh, pol uh, transportation policy board uh, at mag and we are now meeting weekly uh, in uh, an effort to wrap up the regional transportation plan and, and uh, I want you to know that from the City Mesa's perspective that is going well. Uh, I think a lot of the, the priorities that, that we discussed a, a week or so ago uh, are, are in that plan. <clears throat> so I'm optimistic that that's uh, going to be resolved uh, in, a, in a good fashion very shortly. Uh, also couple of days ago I uh, was pleased to go to uh, I also represent this this council at the uh, Phoenix Mesa Gateway Airport Board Authority uh, and uh, uh, will be taking my turn this next year as the chairman of that board so uh, if you have any complaints about uh, your baggage being mishandled or anything please let me know I'll be happy to do what I can to make things right um, but uh, again the uh, it, it, it's 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 fun to go to those meetings again because uh, people are flying again and and we're, the this uh, uh, odd year that we've experienced is is starting to become an asterisk at the bottom of, of the report so uh, uh, a, a lot, uh, we continue to see new destinations out of that airport and, and uh, I, I think things very good things are happening out there as well if there's nothing else uh, mr. Brady what is our schedule of future meetings look like <laughs> Just a reminder, we do have a study session and council meeting uh, on Monday, June 21st. We're going to ask the council uh, if you will allow us to start a little bit early at 5 o'clock. We have two items, a few items we want to cover with you that are coming back uh, relating to um, text amendments for um, marijuana facilities as well as community residences. That was if we started with council, we've made it through the planning and zoning. Uh, board and now it's coming back to council so we want to give you a briefing on that before it shows up on the agenda so we're going to spend some time during that study session on monday uh, to review those and then we'll go into the um, and then we'll have the regular council meeting that day also so that's uh monday we'll start at five o'clock thank you okay. sounds good council if there's nothing else is there a motion to adjourn this meeting thank you mr thompson seconded by Ms. spillsbury all in favor please say aye aye, aye. Hi. Thank you. We are adjourned.